Hello and good morning, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me okay. If not, we've done a sound check, so I encourage you to increase your volume, speaker volume. Uh, but welcome to the State Water Board's workshop on the water manage measurement and reporting regulation, often referred to as SB88. My name is Kartiki Naik, and I'm a water resource control engineer in the State Water Board's Division of Water Rights. And I'll be facilitating today's workshop. The purpose of this workshop is for the water board staff to go over new guidance materials related to the water measurement and reporting regulation, including what materials are available, where you can find them, and how to use them. There will also be an opportunity at the end of the presentation for any questions. Today's workshop is being recorded and will be available on our website along with the presentation slides as soon as possible. Here we have a Zoom poll just before we get started, as we wanted to get a sense of who is joining us today. Um, in the Zoom poll shown, please take a few minutes to choose which option best describes you. It's always fun to see a poll in action. Okay. All right, I think we are plateauing now, so that's probably enough time. And we can see a fairly even distribution between water providers and attorneys, consultants, ag water users, uh, government, and some others, a few hydropower utility. Well, thank you for participating and joining this workshop. The results are being shared right now and you can see them. Uh, if you would like to spend a little more time on of, to look at the results, you may do so, but we'll be advancing the slides. So please clo close the poll window when you're done viewing the results. Okay, so I'd like to go over some ground rules. Please remember that this is a public workshop. And as such, we ask that you keep any discussions respectful and be polite when others are speaking. We recognize that everyone in attendance is coming to this discussion with their own unique perspectives and experiences. Please listen actively to the conversation and keep an open mind. Please respect other points of view, even if you do not agree with them. Lastly, we have limited time today and a lot of information to cover. When we get to the question and answer portion of today's workshop, we ask that you please stay on topic to allow us to answer as many questions as possible. Now for some logistics. Today's workshop will have two parts. First, a staff presentation about the regulation, followed by a question and answer period. For any questions that arise during the staff presentation, we encourage you to use the Zoom Q&A feature. Water board staff will be monitoring and responding to questions submitted in the Q&A. There is a chat feature as well, but we ask that you do not use the chat feature unless you're experiencing technical difficulties. In this case, you can directly message the co-hosts. All other questions during the presentation should be submitted via the Q&A feature. Later, during the dedicated Q&A period, you may also ask questions aloud by raising your hand in Zoom. To do this, click on the reactions icon at the bottom of the Zoom window there you will see a raise hand option. For those joining us by phone, you can also raise your hand by dialing star nine. As a reminder, this workshop, including the question and answer period is being recorded. If you have any questions that you prefer not be recorded, please feel free to email your questions to dwr-measurement at waterboards.ca.gov shown at the bottom of the slide. That brings us to the end of the logistics review. 
next we move on to staff presentation. As a reminder, you may add written questions in the Q&A feature during the presentation or save them later for the question and answer period. I'll now hand it over to Anthony to begin the staff presentation. Thanks for the introduction, Kartiki. Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Southwood, and I'm an environmental scientist in the Drought Planning Unit in the Division of Water Rights. So during this presentation, we will be covering some basics of the water measurement and reporting regulation, including the background and intent behind its implementation. We will then go into some of the requirements of the regulation, including whom it applies to, how to measure and report, and requirements regarding who can be considered a qualified individual. Afterwards, we will summarize some of our recent outreach activities and highlight our main findings. We'll wrap up the staff presentation by giving an overview of newly available and planned resources before launching into the question and answer period. Uh, next slide. All right. As mentioned, we'll be starting today's presentation by discussing some basics of the regulation. So why is measuring air diversion important? Well, California is a large state, and the supply and demand for water varies throughout the year and from region to region. Abundant water supplies in one place can occur at the same time as a drought elsewhere, and an area with abundant water in one season may face severe shortages at other times of the year. Having an accurate and robust data set across the state detailing when and where water is available and how much people are using is critical for managing our precious water resources throughout the state. This data is used to inform water planning decisions and improve the way we administer water rights in a changing climate. So the water measurement and reporting regulation can be found in the California Code of Regulations, Title 23, Sections 931 through 938. It was approved by the Office of Administrative Law in 2016 and is often referred to as SB 88 after the 2015 Senate bill, which authorized the regulation. Essentially, this regulation requires many water right holders and claimants to accurately measure and report the volume of water they divert. The required frequency and accuracy of these measurements vary depending on the diversion size, with larger diverters being held to more stringent requirements. The regulation affects between 14,000 and 15,000 water rights and claims throughout California, which amounts to approximately 7,000 diverters. In a few slides, we will describe who is required to measure and report diversions. In your annual reports, you already report the amount of water diverted in each month of the water year. The data submitted under this regulation should supplement and support those monthly totals. Essentially, by reviewing your measurement data, water board staff should be able to verify your annual reports and see how you determine the volume of water diverted under each basis of right. The regulation allows you to use either measuring devices, measurement methods, or a combination of the two to measure your diversions, as long as the appropriate frequency and accuracy criteria are met. If there is no feasible way for you to meet the requirements, you may propose an alternative compliance plan, provided it meets the specified criteria. We will go into more detail on measuring devices, measurement methods, and alternative compliance plans in a few slides. With that, I'll pass it over to Riley to go over some of the key requirements under the regulation. Thanks, Anthony. My name is Riley Nolan. I'm a water resource control engineer in the Division of Water Rights Drought Planning Unit. My portion of today's presentation is intended to give a general overview of the requirements of the regulation. For a thorough description of requirements, we would strongly suggest reading and reviewing the text of the regulation itself or reviewing our new measurement and reporting manual, which we will discuss later in the workshop. So let's start off by giving an overview of who is actually subject to the regulation. Whether you're subject to the regulation depends on the volume of water that you are authorized to divert, not necessarily what you divert in a given year. And that threshold upon which the measurement requirements come into effect is generally 10 acre feet per year. So starting with diverters with pre-1914 appropriative or riparian claims of right, which are filed under statements of statements of water diversion and use. And as a reminder, those are uh, the water rights with IDs beginning with the letter S. If in the past you have ever diverted more than 10 acre feet per year, or if you intend to divert more than 10 acre feet per year in the future, you are subject to the regulation and must measure your diversions. For diverters who have post-1914 appropriative water rights in the form of a license, a permit, or a temporary permit, and I'll note that the standard licenses and permits have water right IDs beginning with the letter A, and temporary permits have water right IDs beginning with the letter T. The 10 acre foot per year threshold is based off of the maximum amount of water that you are legally authorized to divert each year, 
which is also referred to as the water right's face value. I'll note that uh, temporary permits may have some additional measurement and reporting requirements specified in their terms and conditions. So we would remind you to review your, your water right uh, terms and conditions and, and definitely reach out to us if you have any questions. Similarly, for registrations or those water rights beginning uh, with the letter D, L, or H, the 10 acre foot per year threshold is based off of your registration space value. Or for those who divert to storage, the threshold is based off of the storage capacity of your uh, facility. So I'd like to emphasize that the threshold is not based off of how much you actually divert to storage in a given year. Rather, it's based on the capacity of your storage facility. Now suppose you as an individual diverter have several water rights or claims of right, which is the case for many diverters throughout the state. For any combination of rights and or claims that divert either from the same point of diversion or serve the same place of use, the regulation could apply to you if the total authorized volume uh, to be diverted through the same point of diversion or serving the same place of use exceeds that 10 acre foot per year threshold. Can move on to the next slide. So now that we've gone over who is subject to the regulation, we can get into what it actually means to measure and report your diversion data. Um, so each year, you will need to report to the water board how much water you diverted under your water right or rights. The goal is to compile an accurate and robust data set of diversions throughout the state. So it's therefore required that the reported volumes be accurate to within about 10 to 15% of the actual diverted volume. However, you have a bit of flexibility in how you can go about measuring your diversion. So I'd like to start off by kind of defining a few key terms uh, before we get into the logistics of measuring. These terms are measuring device, measurement method, and alternative compliance plan. Uh, these are the three options for measuring your diversion. So a measuring device is probably the most straightforward approach. A measuring device is defined as anything that measures the water volume, the flow rate or velocity of water, or the elevation of water at a reference location. Example devices could be totalizers, flow meters, weirs, staff gauges, etc. By using a measuring device, you should be able to easily calculate the volume of water diverted under a single water rate. <clears throat> A uh, measurement method is a little bit more loosely defined. Basically, it's any other way of accurately measuring or calculating diversion volumes that would not fall under the definition of a measuring device. A few examples could be uh, using electricity records, for example, associated with a pump uh, to calculate how much water is diverted based off of how long the pump was operating. Or another example could be a group of diverters who opt to share a measuring device and calculate how much water is diverted under each water right. A measuring device can be thought of as a meter that may require a simple calculation to convert the measured parameter to volume, whereas a measurement method usually involves a bit of extra math to determine the volume of water diverted. Lastly, we have alternative compliance plans. We recognize that using a measuring device or measurement method may not always be possible to meet your measurement requirements. And in these cases, diverters can implement what we call an alternative compliance plan uh, to measure their diversions. There are a number of circumstances in which an alternative compliance plan could be appropriate. Maybe you cannot safely access your diversion location. Maybe there is an electricity available at your diversion location. Uh, or perhaps measuring your diversion would result in the waste and unreasonable use of water. If your diversion scenario matches any of a, a handful of acceptable reasons why you cannot meet all of the regulations requirements, you can submit and implement an alternative compliance plan describing what you propose to do instead. I'd like to emphasize that uh, diverters who use an alternative compliance plan must still measure and report their diversions, um, and they must try to meet as many of the requirements of the regulation as possible, but there's a little bit of extra flexibility just because we recognize that it's not always possible to install a flow meter or implement a measurement method. Uh, so you should all now see another Zoom poll shortly. We'll bring that up. Um, looks like it's up right now. We would like to know how you are all measuring your diversions. Um, please choose all that apply for any or all of your water rights. I'd like to remind folks that the results of this poll are anonymous. So if you're not measuring your diversion, don't be afraid to answer that question. 
<clears throat> and we'll give it a, a few seconds for people to respond. Okay, it looks like the response rate is slowing down a little bit. And I'll go ahead and share the results. So it looks like uh, roughly three quarters of the folks who responded use a measuring device. Um, and again, there were the option to, to select multiple responses. So it may not add up uh, to 100, but Looks like 43% uh, chose me measurement method, fewer chose alternative compliance plans, a few folks aren't sure, and then uh, uh, approximately 12% said none, I do not measure my diversion. Um, so that was helpful. I think uh, interesting to see how, how folks are measuring or whether they're measuring. <clears throat> but uh, just like to remind you, you can close the poll window when you're done viewing the results and we'll move on with the slides. So in the previous slides, we discussed how the applicability of this regulation varies based off of the type of water right that you have. But after establishing that you were required to measure and report your diversions, your measurement requirements are generally based off of whether you directly divert or divert to storage. Again, these thresholds are based off of authorized diversion amounts or the capacity of your storage facilities, as well as the sum of authorized diversions from the same point of diversion or serving the same place of excuse me, same place of use. Starting off with uh, the largest diverters in the state, those who are authorized to divert at least 1,000 acre feet per year, or those with storage facilities with a capacity of at least 1,000 acre feet, uh, they are required to measure their diversions at least once every hour. I'd like to note that there are a few additional telemetry requirements that apply at the 10,000 acre foot threshold. And we won't get into the telemetry requirements today, but you can refer to our website and guidance documents for more information. And as always, you can send us an email and, and reach out if you have any questions. The next highest tier of diver, uh, diverters, those who are authorized to directly divert at least 100 acre feet per year, or those who have a storage uh, capacity of 200 acre feet or more, are required to measure their diversions daily. The next tier requires weekly measurement for direct diversions of at least 10 acre feet per year or storage facilities with a capacity of 50 acre feet. And finally, the lowest tier requires monthly measurements for storage facilities with a capacity of at least 10 acre feet. So now that we've gone over how to measure, I will pass it over to my colleague Sierra to go over how to report. Thanks, Riley. My name is Sierra Kennison, and I'm a Water Resource Control Engineer in the Drought Planning Unit of the Division of Water Rights. The essential procedure for reporting your measurement data is to first convert your measurements into the volume of water diverted per each water right, prepare a data file for each water right, and then upload your data file and any calculations or formulas to your annual report. On this slide, there are some common calculations to convert from flow rate or water velocity to volume. Although we are not going to discuss telemetry requirements in depth during today's workshop, I do want to note that even if you're required to telemeter your diversion and post your measurements to a public website each week, you are still required to submit a measurement data file with your annual reports. Next slide, please. I wanna spend a bit of time going over what we mean by the term data file. In general, data files are where your measurements are recorded and should have information about when the measurement was taken, what the measurement was, and what the corresponding volume is. Your data files do not need to be overly complicated, but must meet a few criteria. To make it easier for you to prepare an acceptable data file, we have added a series of templates to our measurement and reporting regulation website. This slide shows an, an example data file using our template for measurements that were recorded on a daily basis. So now let's go over it. First, we need to be able to open the data files in either Microsoft Excel or Microsoft Access. The most common file types are usually Excel files, CSV files, or text files. Within each data file, the first row should contain column headings that clearly describe the information conveyed in each column. This information should include the date and timestamp of the measurement, the measurement itself with the corresponding units, 
and the volume of water diverted for the applicable water right or claim, again with the corresponding units. Please note that the units are written out in their entirety and not abbreviated. We strongly recommend that you perform quality assurance and quality control protocols on your data to make sure your measuring devices are operating properly. If you note any data quality issues, please provide a QAQ seed value in addition to the raw measurement value from your device or method and add a data flag as appropriate to describe the issue. In this example, you can easily understand that this diverter measured the flow rate past a certain point every day. And by looking at just the volume column, you can see it looks very similar to what you enter in your annual reports. But instead of 12 rows of diverted volumes with one row per month, the data file has additional rows to account for the daily measurement frequency requirement. Next slide, please. Here are some examples of what should not be in your data files. In general, we want to avoid anything that does not clearly convey what was measured and any formats that cannot be easily and automatically read by a machine. Data that is provided through a hyperlink or presented in an image or narrative description cannot be easily processed. Similarly, data that is presented with multiple tables or with multiple tabs in a single data file also causes issues with machine readability. Instead, we would prefer data to be entered into the individual cells of the spreadsheet and to use only one tab per data file. You may submit multiple data files if needed. Irrelevant data about uh, maybe water quality parameters or pH or temperature, these are not relevant to the water measurement and reporting regulation, and so they do not need to be included in your data file. To reiterate, the main items to include are the date and time of measurement, the raw and QAQC to measured values with units, and the volume of water diverted for each priority of right, also with units. Without these key pieces of information, the Water Board is unable to effectively review the data file or relate it back to the applicable annual report, and therefore the data is not usable. We highly recommend that you use the provided templates to ensure that your data file contains the appropriate information and is formatted correctly. Another term that I want to discuss is qualified individual. The regulation makes repeated reference to the term qualified individual and requires them for all diversions, regardless of whether you use a measuring device, measurement method, or an alternative compliance plan. This slide provides a basic summary of the types of tasks a qualified individual is required to perform, but the main point I really want to emphasize is that every diversion needs a qualified individual. Even if you use an, an alternative compliance plan, a qualified individual may be responsible for multiple tasks, including certifying accuracy, inspecting, calibrating, or testing the measurement setup, approving any conversions, etc., depending on your proposed plan. For a thorough explanation of what a qualified individual does, please refer to the regulation text itself or to our measurement and reporting manual, which we will cover later in the presentation. So who can be a qualified individual? For smaller diversions of less than 100 acre feet per year, any person trained and experienced in water measurement and reporting can be a qualified individual. It is highly recommended to have completed a course in water measurement, but it is not a requirement. For diversions of 100 acre feet per year or more, qualified individuals must either be a registered professional engineer or someone working under their supervision, a licensed contractor for C57 well drilling or C61 D21 limited specialty in machinery and pumps, or a diverter who has completed a course on measurement devices and methods offered through the UC Cooperative Extension. We will put a PDF of this presentation on our website, and in the PDF, the blue text on this slide will link to the UC Cooperative Extension website, and from there you should be able to find more information on how to register for one of their measurement classes. Information is also available on our website. As a reminder, as with the section on the applicability of the regulation, the thresholds shown here are for authorized diversion amounts. So it's the face value or maximum historical diversion, not necessarily what is actually diverted in a given year. That concludes our overview of the regulation and its requirements. I will now pass it over to Ben to summarize some of our recent efforts. Thanks, Sierra. My name is Ben Trin, and I am an engineering geologist in the drought planning unit of the Division of Water Rights. Before we get into the discussion of new guidance materials, we wanted to highlight some of the outreach efforts 
the State Water Board has been doing in the lead up to this guidance. This outreach has been ongoing for the last several months and has had three main goals. To clarify confusion with regulation, to better understand complaints and sources of frustration, and to solicit feedback and suggestions from people affected by the regulation. We wanted to make sure we had a firm grasp on what people wanted and needed to boost compliance rates and improve the quality of the data being submitted to the board. Prior to initiating our outreach program, staff reviewed hundreds of data file submissions to look for any patterns in the data files being submitted and identify where diverters seem to run into problems with measuring and reporting. This helped us pinpoint areas where the regulation was particularly unclear or susceptible to misinterpretation. In spring and summer of this year, we reached out to diverters across the state. This included municipal and agricultural water providers, hydropower operators, consultants, and even government entities. We met one-on-one -on -one with each and provided an opportunity for them to explain their operations and provide feedback on the regulation, including difficulties they have had in complying, any complaints they have, and any specific questions for the board. We then opened the discussion to the wider public and hosted both in-person and virtual listening sessions in August to hear feedback from a wider audience. Over 200 people registered for these sessions, representing large and small diverters and every interval in between. Based on what we learned during our outreach, we created a handful of guidance materials, which is the focus of the rest of today's workshop. This slide shows some of the key findings from our various outreach efforts. Many people express frustration that they do not see why the State Water Board needs this data, and that is not obvious how the data is used. California's climate patterns are shifting, and the old approach of collecting estimates of monthly water use is no longer fit for the purpose of managing this precious resource. We need finer resolution data to better inform how we administer the water rights system and make water management decisions. The bottom line is that we can't manage what we don't measure. And measurements reported under this regulation provide the accurate, fine resolution data needed to make sure water is available to those who need it. Another common concern that was brought up relates to the 10 acre foot threshold for whether the regulation applies. Some watersheds are more vulnerable to water shortages than others, and a blanket threshold as low as 10 acre feet might not be appropriate everywhere. We are currently reviewing water supply and demand trends in different watersheds to consider revising the measurement threshold. Other concerns related to logistics of the regulation, measuring diversions is complicated and can be expensive. And sometimes water can be transferred between different water right holders and there can be confusion over who is responsible for measuring or frustration that multiple parties are measuring the same water. These are complex issues and we've done our best to address them in our new guidance materials. But please feel free to reach out to us for one-on-one -on -one support. Through our outreach, we also heard that people are eager for templates and more standardized reporting materials. As we touched upon in previous slides, we've created a set of templates that you can use to report your diversions. We'll go into more details in a few slides. Lastly, various diverters express a desire for more partnership to improve the ease and accuracy of reporting. We encourage diverters to collaborate on a local or regional basis to collectively measure diversions. However, you must be sure to submit a measure method explaining how you ultimately parse out diversion volumes by water rate. As mentioned, the Division of Water Rights has been busy discussing developing guidance tools to clarify the regulation and simplify the measurement and reporting process. There are three main materials we've produced so far, a reference manual for the regulation, data file templates, and a frequently asked questions document. I will now pass on over to my colleague Pablo to go over each of these materials. Thanks, Ben. My name is Pablo Ortiz, and I'm an environmental scientist with the Division of Water Rights Drought Planning Unit. First up is our measurement and reporting manual. This document is a reference guide that breaks down the regulation piece by piece and makes it a bit easier to understand. Instead of being written in confusing legal language like the regulation itself, we've tried to translate everything into much more understandable English. The manual contains a glossary of key terms such as qualified individual, measuring device, etc and a thorough explanation of requirements, specifications, 
and procedures for all things related to the regulation. We've also included appendices with a few special scenarios. Please note that this is just the first version of the manual. We plan to update it to include more appendices for additional diversion and measurement scenarios in the future. The Water Board is also working on updating its water rights database. So as our data intake and storage capabilities improve, our guidance will be updated accordingly. Our website has the most up-to-date version, so please always refer to the website to make sure you're accessing the correct document. We will also send out an email announcement whenever a new version is released, so please make sure you're subscribed to our water measurement email topic. As we've mentioned, staff have developed a series of data file templates to make it easier to submit measurement data. On our website, you'll find five templates that correspond with measurement frequency requirements, hourly, daily, weekly, and monthly data collection, as well as a template for custom time intervals if you measure more frequently than your requirement. You'll also find a detailed instruction manual that walks you through the process of filling out the template. In the coming weeks, we'll be releasing an accompanying video tutorial that will go over the process of uploading your data file to your annual report. So stay tuned for that announcement via email. We've walked through the contents of the data file template earlier in the presentation, but there are a few things to note. First, these templates are not mandatory and other formats may be acceptable if they meet regulation requirements but we do highly recommend using them if you're unsure how to structure your data and encourage everyone, regardless of if they're using them or not, to review them to better understand what constitutes a good data file. Um, keep in mind some of the things that Sierra mentioned, like the column headers and uh, including units. Data file templates do help to create a more streamlined database where we can efficiently analyze all the data submitted by many diverters all at once since the files are all in the same format. Templates also help reduce errors and take the guesswork out of it, since they're set up so you can easily provide necessary data according to your specific requirements. Another thing I want to point out is that these data file templates are only to be used for the current reporting year, the water year extending from October 1st, 2022 to September 30th, 2023. Please check back next year for templates for the 2024 water year. If you run into any issues, please let us know so we can help you and make the necessary fixes to the templates. We mentioned that we did several months of outreach leading up to this guidance release. And in our conversation with a variety of stakeholders, a handful of questions came up again and again. In response, we've addressed these concerns in a frequently asked questions or FAQ document, which you will soon be able to find on our website. We'll send an announcement by email when it's posted. Questions are sorted by topic, so there are specific sections for data file and submission questions, measuring device questions, questions on telemetry, etc. If you have any additional questions that are not included in the FAQ, please reach out to us and we'd be happy to help. We've gone through the new main guidance materials, but we also have a few other announcements today. Our measurement and reporting regulation website has been updated. The URL is the same, so you'll still be able to access it the same way, but the layout is a little different. The goal of this change is for the website to be a streamlined hub of resources. You can still find important information about who, what, why of the regulation, but you'll also see a collection of other resources available to you, including the guidance materials we've gone through today. We hope that this update will make it easier for you to find what you're looking for instead of needing to scroll through pages of legal and technical language. The new website is live as of today, so expect a formal email announcement in the coming days. As we touched upon earlier, we have compiled a summary of feedback from our listening sessions. This includes questions, concerns, frustrations, all about the measurement and reporting regulation. A copy of that summary will be available on our website soon. For those of you who have submitted measurement method and ACP forms on our form and sub survey submittal portal, please be aware that you must renew those forms every five years. You should now have access to a separate renewal form in the portal. Please use the renewal option to update and renew your existing measurement method or ACP. Here's a brief list of upcoming things to keep in mind. Remember that the annual reports for water year 2023 are due by February 1st of uh, 2024. We would also like to announce that the drought planning unit will be hosting office hours for one-on-one -on -one support. These office hours will be held during the weeks of December 11th, December 18th, and January 8th, with the possibility to add more if needed. To sign up, simply send us an email with your preferred date and time, 
and a description of what you would like to discuss, and we'll schedule a virtual meeting where we can sit down and work through any specific concerns, questions, or measurement scenarios with you. Again, that email address is dwr-measurement at waterboards.ca.gov or on the screen. Lastly, I want to mention that the guidance documents discussed today may be updated in the future. Our goal is to have guidance that is useful for every diverter, small and large, simple and more complex. We know that we haven't addressed every concern in our latest guidance, so we plan to have future iterations with additional scenarios and further clarifications. If there is a particular subject you wish to see in our future guidance, please feel free to send us an email. Shown here are links to our measurement and reporting website, as well as to the regulation text itself. All the guidance documents discussed today are or will soon be available on our website. With that, I'll pass it back to Kartiki. Thanks, Pablo. That concludes the staff presentation portion of today's workshop. Before continuing on, we would like to take a short break. Please return by 10.50. After that break, we'll have our question and answer period. Hello and welcome back. Uh, let's begin the question and answer period. As a reminder, today's workshop is being recorded. This concludes the question and answer period. If you have a question but would prefer to not be recorded, you may email us at the email address shown at the bottom of the screen. Otherwise, you can raise your hand through the reactions icon at the bottom of the screen and the waterboard staff will invite you to unmute. For those calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Once we invite you to unmute, you may do so by dialing star six. We'll do our best to answer questions in the order in which they are received. We're also accepting and responding to written questions in the Q&A feature. I'm sorry, I was muted. So I see a hand up, Deborah Schaefer. I can see your hand up and please if you would unmute and ask your question. Hi, my question is, what if our divert to storage, our face value of our water right is for 12 acre feet? A few years ago, we removed two boards on the spillway that we know reduced our max storage capacity. And we also have silt buildup over about a 40 or 50 year period. This is a water right for a small HOA that we inherited when the property was subdivided and the HOA was created. So the question is whether we really even have, we know we, we're pretty certain we don't have 12 acre feet, but I don't know how to prove it. And we are questioning whether we're even able to store 10 acre feet. And it's a man-made dam that was put in you know, 50, 60 years ago. So at this point, I actually was investigating how we would abandon our water right, but then when I looked at the questions online on your website, it would appear we'd have to take the dam down, which could get, you know, more complicated. So the question is, how would we prove, would, would you guys work with us to help figure out our acre feet? I mean, this is just a, a pond 
that has a, an unmanned creek that comes into it and rainwater runoff. Thank you for your question, Deborah. That's a great question. And actually one that I think speaks to a lot of scenarios throughout the state. Um, so the water board actually has an avenue just to address this scenario. It's really helpful. It's called a partial revocation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so what you can do is, is essentially send us a form saying that you would like to reduce the face value of your water right. And so, you know, it sounds like that could be appropriate in this situation where you believe the capacity of your reservoir and your ability to divert, you know, 12 acre feet is not correct. You know, we would probably require some form of like a survey to be done, a qualified individual, professional engineer to go out and, um, you know, run some studies to actually, you know, gauge the true capacity of that small pond um, and we could revise your water right accordingly. And, you know, it sounds like, you know, with the accumulation of silts and the, the changes that you've made um, to the structure, it may not be able to support a storage uh, capacity of 10 acre feet. And if that's the case and, you know, your capacity is lower than 10 acre feet, we could adjust your water right space value to be lower and possibly, um, you know, no longer subject to these measurement and reporting requirements. And, you know, I'd like to say that, you know, anyone who has a water right can submit a partial revocation if you are not really exercising the full extent of your water right. Um, and, you know, we would encourage you to email uh, that email address shown on the slide, dwr-measurement at waterboards.ca.gov. And we'd be happy to walk you through that process or answer any questions that you have. Do you guys have engineers that would do that? Or do we have to hire somebody independent you would likely need to hire someone, you know, I, I think it's um, maybe someone else on, on my side can speak to this in, in more detail, but I don't think that the board staff would go out and actually assess the, the new capacity of your pond that would likely require, um, you know, hiring a consultant on your end. Okay. And then the last question would be, if we do that, we wouldn't have to take the dam down because actually out of our 19 parcels that are in here, no one wants to take the dam down. We like it when it has water in it for a few months out of the year, but um, we don't, we're concerned about the escalating requirements. I'm a volunteer and, you know, it's just getting more and more, you know, like I said, we're a homeowners association for a road maintenance. That's it. And now we're having to handle this and it's become Every year it's more complicated and I, and no one else, I've done it for 20 something years, no one else wants it. So we need to figure out what our path forward looks like. So I like your suggestion. Yeah, I definitely encourage you to, you know, send us an email. We can set up a time, you know, I'd be happy to meet with you one-on-one -on -one and discuss the specifics. I don't know that I can speak to, you know, whether the dam would need to be removed in its entirety, but if there's some way of verifying that its capacity is lower than 10 acre feet, um, you know, we can, we can process that partial revocation. You can keep your water right. You would just be authorized for a smaller amount and potentially no longer subject to these measurement requirements. So okay. definitely do send us an email and I'd be happy to help you I out. will. Thank you. Again, you can um, click on your reactions icon and raise your hand to ask any questions at this point in time. Those calling on phone can raise your hand by pressing star nine. And once we request you to unmute, you may dial star six to unmute. You're also taking, we have another one. I'll call on your name, Marcus Negren. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, and I kind of assume this goes under the, uh, it's in the measurement reporting manual. But uh, as far as flow meter verification, things like that, um, you know, do you guys have a suggestion or, or um, you know, this is a this is a bigger water right? I'm not talking about 10 acre feet here. I'm talking about a few hundred per year. But is there a suggestion on, on metering and, and how often you'd be checking those um, or any kind of input you can give on that? Thank you, Marcus. Um, 
our staff will respond to that shortly. Marcus, if you don't mind, could you repeat your question, please? Yeah, no problem. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I have mo multiple flow meters uh, of multiple different rights. Um, and, um, you know, they're, they're not optimal flow meter sites per se. And I have the tools to verify those flow meters. Um, you know, that being said, it, it's, you know, it's not in my backyard. I can't just go test them right away. I'm kind of curious uh, if you guys have any recommendation or um, advice, and I'm, I'm going to look into the measurement and reporting manual after this, but uh, any recommendations or advice on uh, how often I need to be calibrating um, those meters or, or checking those meters for accuracy. I know we talked about that 10 to 15%, but um, yeah, I was just looking for kind of general suggestions or, or rules of thumb or something like that. Thank you, Marcus. Great. Thanks for the clarification, Marcus. Um, and when you mentioned like having tools to do it, I assume you mean the tools to actually do the calibration in the field or confirm things. And you're the qualified individual for this water writer claim, correct? Yes. Well, I work under a qualified individual, um, and yes, I have, I mean, I have the tools to, to, um, you know, stream gauge, do things like that in the field. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Um, and by like working under a qualified individual, um, is that then, um, like you're working under a registered professional engineer? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So you can do the calibrations in the field every five years is the requirement under the regulations. And the qualified individual would need to sign off and confirm on those calibrations. Sure. Okay. Um, I guess what if I check it, you know, to calibrate a meter and I'm like, oh, shoot, it's 25% off, you know, and then you know, I, I can make some sort of adjustment or, you know, the qualified um, individual can make some sort of adjustment um, and then I don't need to check it again for five years or? or... That is correct. Yes. So you'd need okay. to calibrate it every five years to make sure it's within the required accuracy for your diversion okay. type, which is likely 10%. Um, it's occasionally 15% yeah. depending on when it was installed. So um, as long as you confirm every five years, at least every five years that it's within the required accuracy, then that is what's required of you. Now, if you know, you note that one of those measuring devices tends to be the really finicky one that seems to get out of calibration pretty off often for whatever reason, you're definitely encouraged to check it more frequently, but it is no more, uh, it's not required. It would be a best practice, but it is not required to do it more often than every five years. Okay. Thank you. That's a lot of help. And I, I do have a couple of those finicky ones as well as some of those ones that are, are pretty solid every, every time I check them. So appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. And if you are using our data file templates, it might be helpful to note in there also that um, some of the, uh, if, if you're noticing some strange recordings to maybe note that there's some issues with the calibration of this device. Okay. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Thank you, Marcus. Okay, we have Matthew next, Matthew Donohue. Hi, um, my question is during the presentation, I heard someone say that there's a form that has to be submitted every five years, uh, updating your uh, water measurement, uh, water measurement information, but I can't find it on your website. So how do I find that form? That is a great question. So I think what you were hearing uh, was 
with respect to measurement methods and alternative compliance plans. Those two, I guess, avenues of measuring your diversion require a form to be submitted on our water rights form and survey submittal portal. And that form needs to be, uh, I guess, revised or I guess updated every five years. Um, if you don't see the form on your survey portal, you know, we would encourage you to reach out to us and we can kind of walk you through the steps step by step. Um, but I'd also just like to reiterate that's only applicable for diverters that use a measurement method or an alternative compliance plan. Um, if you measure with a strict kind of one measuring device at each point of diversion, that probably doesn't apply to you, but you know, we would encourage you to send us an email if, if you have further questions and, and we can look at your scenario more in depth. What follow-up question though, um, you earlier said that a staff gauge qualified as a measuring device um, and that's the technology that we're using. Um, so, and, and you said the, the reporting portal, do you mean the portal where we go in and actually do the water right report? That's a great question. So there is RMS or report management system. That is where water right holders submit their annual reports and upload their measurement data. We have a separate portal that's kind of used for some, um, I guess, smaller reporting aspects. Um, with respect to your water right. And that is where the measurement method and alternative compliance plan forms are held. Um, if you have yeah, further questions, we'd be happy to walk you through them on a call, but uh, those are the two distinct kind of portals that we have with respect to uh, the measurement regulation. Thank you. And also to follow up with that, uh you're supposed to update all of the information. If you like got a new device or something, that would be on your yearly report. So any any of that information needs to be updated yearly. Like so your measurement device type or whatever. If any of that changes, it would be yearly and not five years. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh any information that goes into your annual statement. So like the when you upload your data file to through RMS to the annual statement. Uh, it also includes like the device uh, type and information, uh, qualified individual, all that stuff needs to be updated yearly. So if it, if it changes. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Matthew. Um, I wanted to go back on the record for a response to Marcus's question about the required calibration time. Um, went ahead, did a quick check, uh, look at the regulations here. And I just wanted to confirm that calibration is required at least once every five years, but the diverter is responsible for more frequent calibration um, as necessary to ensure the device has that meets the accuracy requirements. So Marcus, I'd like to revise what I previously said is that um, you, if you know that devices are getting out of uh, sync with the accuracy requirements more frequently than five years, then you are required to go out and do additional calibration more frequently than five years. I apologize for any confusion I may have caused. I'll just pause there, Matthew, um, for a bit. But if you have any other questions, again, you can use the reactions icon at the bottom of your screen, screen. Or if you're on your phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Just pausing a little bit more in case we have more questions.
I see no other hands raised as of now. Um, this is being recorded. So if you would like to email us your questions, you can email at the email address shown at the bottom of the screen, which is dwr measurement at waterboards.ca.gov. We are also accepting and responding to written questions in the Q&A feature. Okay, um, before we end today's workshop, please take a moment to provide us feedback on this presentation and let us know if there's any other clarity that we can provide. This poll is anonymous, so please email us with special questions if you want a response, since we cannot see who completed the poll. Um, just to note, there are two questions on this poll, so don't miss the second one. And if there's specifically, you can point us to what you found helpful so that we may um, work on that more in the future. The second question addresses that. I'd also just like to point out that we are still responding to some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, and there may be a few that we can respond to live. Um, and I'll actually go ahead and get started with that. I see one question from Mark Peters. Are curtailment orders temporary or are they permanent? And then you follow up saying, we should know that answer today. Uh, you know, I can't speak to the specific order that you were sent. And I would certainly ask that you email us with any specifics so we can get you the most appropriate answer. You know, generally curtailment orders would remain in effect until they are lifted, you know, until you receive some communication that states otherwise. In some cases, curtailment orders may have required you to uh, you know, check a website at a certain frequency to make sure that you can divert under your water right. Um, but you know, we certainly wouldn't want you to uh, be unaware of your curtailment status. So please do send us an email. And if you can reference the name or title of the order um, that you're, you have a question about, we can, we can follow up with the appropriate folks on our end and get you the right answer there. We have another question um, from an anonymous participant saying, how many suppliers are in compliance with SB 88? <clears throat> I think, you know, I don't know that we can give uh, an exact percentage answer uh, to that question. If you have a specific question, I would encourage you to email us. Um, compliance with SB 88 and with the measurement and reporting requirements is a little bit more nuanced, I think, than um, than a lot of people really realize, just because there are so many different ways that folks can comply with the regulation. You can have a measuring device, a measurement method, and alternative compliance plans. And even within those you know, different avenues of measurement, there are different levels of compliance. Maybe someone submitted an alternative compliance plan, but hasn't submitted their measurement data, right? So you know, there are a few different levels to compliance, um, but we would be interested in knowing your question um, and would be happy to meet with you and, and take a look at that question in more detail. Let's see, see a few more questions coming in on the Q&A. <clears throat> and you know, some of these maybe are a little bit specific um, and we may ask that you email us um, if we aren't able to get to it in the workshop, you know, there could be some, scenario specific questions that are just better suited to be addressed in, um, you know, a one-on-one -on -one meeting as opposed to a public workshop. So, you know, 
as was mentioned earlier, we're hosting office hours. It's a great opportunity for folks to um, get some one-on-one -on -one time with technical staff from the water boards. We can answer your questions about the uh, requirements of the measurement regulation, especially in advance of that February 1st annual reporting deadline. Please do email us and take advantage of these office hours. You know, we're really always happy to meet with, with diverters and answer your questions. See another question. If a supplier doesn't have the abil ability to measure yet, will they be required to back report later? That's a great question. You know, we would definitely encourage you to come into compliance with any measurement requirements as soon as you can. Um, and, you know, we, that may also be uh, kind of a specific scenario that we would like to address in a one on one meeting. Um, but definitely would encourage you to come into compliance uh, as, as soon as possible. Yeah, Riley, I can also speak a little bit to that. Um, we do have the option of submitting, or you have the option of submitting uh, a request for additional time in our form and su survey submittal portal. Although we will note that the regulation has been in effect um, since 2016. So uh, it is it is kind of important that most diverters be up to speed uh, by now, unless they have a new water right. Thanks for adding that, Pablo. Great, uh, great addition. Definitely do submit that request for additional time. Come into compliance as soon as, as feasible. Email us if you have any questions or if there's any way that we can assist you in coming into compliance. Um, I see one question regarding required accuracy for a storage capacity or just capacity less than 10 acre feet. I think as was mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, required, required accuracy is, is based off of a few different criteria. One is the date that the device was installed. The other is the size of the diversion. Um, so, you know, I think we could possibly need uh, some additional information there. Um, I, th I think that was a, that was adding on to his other question that I answered while you were answering other questions. So perfect. Thank but you. But actually, I don't think we had really gave a good answer, but basically he, like it was the dual reservoir under one right issue. And so there's nothing defined for a reservoir because of the way it's worded in the regs. It's like, um, it's like reservoirs over 10 acre feet and below 50 acre feet have X amount of um, required accuracy, but there's nothing for a reservoir under 10 acre feet specifically. But I would say just to be safe, go with the same accuracy as any other measurement device around 10 acre feet between 10 and 50. I don't know, what do you think, Riley? I think we would need to maybe meet with this diverter one-on-one uh, -on -one and just discuss their their situation a little bit more. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, Jesse, you, you have my email. You can email me if you want to talk. And I'm looking at the Q&A and reading some of the, the longer questions right now. I see one question, I'm gonna read it aloud. For multiple points of diversion that are reported pursuant to multiple water rights, either differing in seasons or amounts or a combination here too, is providing the raw meter data log for the diversion enough, or does the math to divide the metered amounts among each water right also need to be uploaded with the annual report? Some of these can be complex and the reports are public. Is there a sensitivity here for work product prepared by a consultant? That is a great question, and it's something that we've seen time and time again. Obviously, points of diversion are frequently shared by multiple water rights. We would ask that you do upload the raw diversion amount, and we recognize that that would cover multiple bases of right in this circumstance, but also parse out that data and show the amount of water being diverted for each basis of right or for the basis of right under which the reporting is taking place. Um, and, you know, we could recognize that there may be certain instances where there's a measured diversion, but maybe uh, you put zero for the amount of water being diverted under the water right, because that water is going to a different water right, for example. Um, again, would encourage you to email us with any specifics on that question, but uh, that's a really great question. Thank you. 
have another question. Please explain the difference between surface water diverters and groundwater pumpers. Are you collecting data of usage from groundwater pumpers or is that regulated by Sigma? So great question. The uh, Generally, the, the division of water rights um, and the water rights permitting system applies to surface water. There are a few really kind of unusual or, or less common instances where groundwater is governed as surface water. Um, we refer to those as subterranean streams or in certain like adjudicated groundwater basins. I would ask if you have any specific questions of, of whether you should be measuring your groundwater diversion and reporting it to us to email that, that email address that you see on the screen, the dwr-measurement at waterboards.ca.gov. Let's see. And then finally, the last written question in our Q&A, we need to report hourly. In any given hour, some of the water could be direct diversion or diversion to storage downstream or re-diversion of water directly diverted upstream or withdrawal from storage. Are we required to provide the total volume through the meter and break it down into these categories? That is a great question. So in your annual reports, you are required to um, report what's directly diverted uh, and what is diverted to storage and what is beneficially used. And that is required to be broken down on a month by month basis. I think what we are looking for with respect to your measurement data file is data, measurement data that supplement and support your totals shown in your annual reports. Um, so to that extent, I think we would want you to break them down, but I would definitely like to open it up to others on my team to weigh in. Uh, if you would like, and then obviously would like you to email us uh, again, the dwr-measurement at waterboards.ca.gov uh, with any specific questions, you know, that may be one we want to walk through a little bit more specifically. And I see Sierra came on camera if you have anything to add. Yeah, I just wanted to add that. Um, so your data file itself does not need to specify how your water is being used, but it should be broken down by water right. So if each of these are separate water rights that each have a different use, then they would need to be separated out. But if it's a single water right that has diversion to storage and direct diversion, then it can all be in one. But in your annual report, I know it's confusing, the data file and the annual report, um, it has those 12 rows, one per month, and it does separate it out by use or diversion type. Thanks for adding. Sierra, I appreciate that. Uh, I think that concludes everything that is in our Q and A. Um, again, if there you have further questions that you didn't want, uh, you know, to vocalize or ask in the Q and A, just because the the workshop is recorded, would encourage you to email. Uh, I know I've said it so many times. Email our dwr measurement at waterboards.ca.gov, um, and we'd be happy to set up, a, you know, a one on one call or answer your question via email. Um, but yeah, I see no further open questions in our Q&A and, and thanks for uh, letting me go through those one by one. But, you know, maybe I'll hand it over to, to Kartiki to conclude today's workshop. Thanks, Riley. I am actually going to pause for a few seconds in case we have more. Thank you for participating in the poll. Um, I think we can, we have sufficient participation now and we can end it. And here are the results. Oops. Um, well, thank you for participating and we have noted what's been helpful and what's not. So far, I see no raised hands and no more open questions. So thank you for joining us today. If you have any other questions, please contact us using the email address provided on this slide. The slide also has the URLs for our measurement and reporting website and regulation text. If you haven't done so already, we strongly encourage you to subscribe to our water measurement email list to receive important information regarding the measurement and reporting regulation, that is SB88. You can sign up on our website. If you have additional feedback that you would like to submit, given that today's um, meeting was recorded or otherwise, please email DWR hyphen measurement at waterboards.ca.gov. We really appreciate your time and participation today. Thank you.